we're at the fifth and final sacrifice offering this morning in Leviticus 5 called the trespass offering. You know, we shouldn't have any problem identifying what this sin is. You ever seen a no trespassing sign? Well, we probably all have seen many no trespassing signs. Man says, this is my property, don't step over this line. God says, I do a line in the sand, this far you go and no further. Otherwise, you're trespassing. Or you've seen a sign, don't tread on me. But the sin of trespassing in God's word extends even further, as we shall see. As I thought about sin and guilt and reconciliation through sacrifices this week, I pondered this. What are the two most important words in Scripture? Two most important words in Scripture. And I thought about that, and I thought they are understanding sin and understanding grace. Sin and grace. You know, we sin because we have a sin nature. We've learned that uh, from these studies inherited from Adam. And God forgives us because his nature is to be full of grace. Paul argued this point in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is no, an astounding, absolute no. So I thought further about that, and I thought, uh, what is sin anyway? You might be interested to know there are 33 words for sin in the New Testament. Dr. Lewis Chaper wrote a thesis on the 33 graces we attain when we receive Christ. Is that a coincidence? There's a grace for every sin? I don't know. Maybe it is. I just thought it was interesting. The 33 words for sin are derivatives of seven Greek words. First of all, I want to give you here a short test. There are three words in the Bible that are used for sin quite often. All three of these are used in Psalms 51, which Bob Vanderzag has memorized, Psalms 51. It's a good one to memorize. So tell me, what are the three words that are most commonly used in the Bible for sin? Transgressions, that's one. Trespass. Trespass, that's two. What's the other one? Other than sin? Iniquity. No, no, iniquity. A word that's used in sin. Yeah, place, place of sin. Those are the three that are used most commonly. What was the third one? Iniquity. iniquity. Trespass, iniquity, and transgression. Okay. Now, rather than give you the 33 words for sin because we're short of time, all I'm going to give you is the seven words that all of the others are derivatives of. The first one, and we've heard this since we're, and I'm not even going to give you the Greek words because I'll have a hard time pronouncing them. I'll just tell you what they mean. The first one is to miss the mark. That is used 221 times in the New Testament. So that's the most common. We miss the mark. And Hebrews 12, 1 says this, and this is where it's used. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us. This sin is to miss the mark. <clears throat> Romans 3, 23 say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we miss the mark. The second one means a fault, this word in the Greek. And 1 Corinthians 6, 7 gives us an example of that. It says, now therefore it is already 
an utter failure, that failure is the word for sin, that you go to law against one another. We're not supposed to sue one another. That's the word, it's a fault if you do that. Giving something less than the full measure. The third one is falling when we should have stood. This is usually an unintentional sin. We stumble, we fall when we should have stood. Ephesians 1 7 says this In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is multiple sins, according to the riches of his glory. An unintentional slip. The fourth is ignorance when one should have known. Hebrews 9 7 says this But unto the second part, the high priest went along, this is the Holy of Holies, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins committed in ignorance. This is our sins committed in ignorance. And we all do that. The lack of knowledge of God's word is the, is the reason for that. Number five is to refuse to hear or heed God's word. 2 Corinthians 10, 6, like to know God's word says and being ready to punish all disobedience that's the word sin when your obedience is fulfilled the six is to intentionally cross a line we've heard that one before you cross a line trespassing Sorry. Hebrews 2 2 this is where it's used says this for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression, that's a word for sin here, and disobedience received a just reward. That is a sin of neglect, and to intentionally cross a line. And the seventh and final is lawlessness, or willfully breaking God's law. Titus 2.14 is where it's used. It says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, sin. So, there you have it. The seven words which the 33 are derived from. So what is sin? Well, I guess the big answer would be breaking God's law. And what is grace? I'll give you another description. God's cure for sin. It's the only way that we can have forgiveness of sin is by his grace. One of these times, when I have time, I'm going to take you through the 33 divine graces that come when we are saved. Now, you probably know two or three. You recognize that you're forgiven for your sin. But there are 33 that you don't even know about. But yet God does this in your life the moment you're saved. Interesting here, by the way, this is by a thesis by uh, Dr. Schaefer, Louis Schaefer, who was the first president of Dallas Theological Seminary. And it's quite a thesis, very thick. I don't have time to do that today. So we're going to move right into Leviticus chapter 5. By the way, there was a preacher one time that said he had made a list of 800 specific sins he had thought of. He was swamped with letters asking for that list. <laughs> Can you imagine? Somebody says, well, maybe there's one I don't know about, or maybe there's one I haven't, you know, I want that list. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. A trespass is an invasion of the rights of either God or man, he said. The list of sins here is obviously not exhausting, but we're going to go through that in Leviticus 5, but gives examples of a limitless number. These are sins of individuals, so the emphasis is on the type of offering and not on the character of the offerer as it was in the sin offering before this. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, If a person sins and hearing the utterance of an oath, and as a witness whether he has 
seen or known of the matter. If he does not tell it, he bears guilt. Let's see if we can break that down a little bit. The four specific sins that are going to be listed here in Leviticus 5 are just merely examples. This first one has to do with hearing an oath and being a witness. Remember when the Apostle Paul was making his way back to Jerusalem and the Jews were very upset with him because they thought that he had left the law and he had left the faith and he had joined the Gentiles and he was against them. So what did he do when he got to Jerusalem? He took a vow. He shaved his head and he took a vow. And what did he do? He took two witnesses with him because he wanted everybody to know, not just of his own word, that he had taken this vow, which was a Jewish vow, that he's still a Jew. He had not left them. Now, if the witness withholds information to the detriment of the one taking an oath, it's a sin of admission. James said in James 4, 17, him to know to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. And again, that's a sin of omission. Some of the greatest sins, by the way, are sins of omission. If someone asks you to pray for them or to pray for someone else and you say, I will do it, do you always do it? Sometimes you forget, don't you? And that's an unintentional sin, but it's still a sin. If we say we should pray for someone, you know what I try to do? I try to do it as quickly as I can before I forget. Because if you wait, you might forget. And if God puts it on your heart to share your faith with someone and you thought, eh, now's not the time. That's a sin. He put it on your heart to share your faith. These are some of the greater sins. By the way, if you tell a half-truth, that's a sin. And the Bible, by the way, calls that a trespass. Jesus, when before the high priest, went on trial, was silent. But when he was put under oath and asked if he was the Christ, the Son of God, he answered, it is as you have said. He told the truth. Verse 2. Or if a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of an unclean livestock, or the carcass of, of an unclean creeping thing, and he is unaware of it, he is also shall be unclean and guilty. Now under the law, a dead carcass touched by men, intentionally or unintentionally, caused that person to be unclean. I can't tell you why. I can only guess. I think it probably was for health reasons. A lot of the laws of food in the Old Testament were because they didn't have the proper facilities to prepare and cook food. It had to do with health reasons, so I'm only guessing that that's it because the Bible doesn't tell us. But it caused them to be unclean. Now this has application, by the way, to us today. We can't be out in the world without becoming unclean. We see things, we hear things, we think unclean thoughts, the makeup of the world is to distract the Christian from pure thoughts. We see it, we hear it, we think it. So we need to cleanse ourselves with prayer and the water of the word. Verse 3. Or if he touches human uncleanness, whatever uncleanness with which a man may be defiled, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. Now, why does God make this distinction between beast and man? The penalty for this is more severe than being unclean with a beast. In Leviticus 11, 24. Going on in verse 4. Or if a person swears, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatever it is that a man may pronounce by an oath, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty in any of these matters. You know, you don't have to go very far to hear a man or a woman swear, do you? 
Just turn on the TV. Things that used to be banned on TV are now, they're out there. Or sometimes people make rash vows, don't they? Remember Jephthah? To offer his daughter as a sacrifice. Simon Peter, did he make a rash vow? He sweared and he vowed to follow Jesus even unto death in front of witnesses. You know, I was thinking about this morning when we were singing the hymns. There were so many hymns that we sing and we don't even pay attention to the words. I surrender all. That's a pretty strong statement. Now, we may think in our own minds, well, that's a go. And maybe that's the way we think of it. But some words of these songs, I mean, they just, uh, they will get you if you think about it. Praising the Lord all day long. Only my mother could do that without stopping. She was capable. I don't know if I am. Let's go on in verse 5. It says, And it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb, or a kid of the goats, as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. This is the first time in all of these offerings that it mentions confession. Confession is commanded for the first time. Why? This has to do with secret sins that nobody knows about. That's why confession is necessary here. The other offerings were an open admission of guilt. Everybody knew they were guilty. They were against God and man. They were hidden sins because that person had not acknowledged them as sin. Now I want to mention a couple of sins of the church that we often don't acknowledge. One is gossip. Now, everybody puts that in the category of a little sin, you know. It was the only sin my mother ever committed. I'm convinced of that. She loved to gossip. And she loved to pull somebody's ear over and say, you know, whisper in their ear. You never know when that's going to get back to somebody and it could hurt them, but gossip is a sin that we seldom ever confess because it's one of those little tiny ones. How about her hyperbole? My wife accuses me of hyperbole and I admit I'm guilty sometimes. You know, fishermen and golfers, they use hyperbole. I made that 40 foot putt. It was actually about six feet. <laughs> you know, at the time it seemed like a 40 foot putt. I hate to reveal my ignorance, but what is hyperbole? Hyperbole. What is it? It's what our Lord used. Hey, pardon? You know, I say it's what our Lord used. Hyperbole is making something out a lot greater than it really is. Oh, exaggeration. He said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle for a rich man to get into heaven. Now that's hyperbole in my opinion. So if he used it, it's okay for me. That's my excuse. But I can't remember ever confessing for using hyperbole. There are little sins that we seldom confess, but we should. Okay, verse seven, I believe I'm up to. Okay, if he is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, which he has committed, two turtle doves and two young pigeons, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. Again, in the trespass offering, God made provision for the poor. God didn't say to the poor, because you are poor, you get a pass. He didn't say it. We do today. But God didn't do that. If he did, they would still bear the guilt of their sins. You know, in our society, we can't even get a law passed that says if an able-bodied person is on welfare, they have to 
work. Or they have to apply for it. We can't get a law passed because everybody's up in rebellion. Those poor people, you're going to make work? If they're able-bodied, the Bible says, if a man doesn't work, neither should he. You know, I... <clears throat> I was going to go somewhere I'm not going to go. <laughs> By the way, if a person works, they have more dignity than if they don't with a handout. That's why I think it's biblical to be able to do that. In verse 8, I believe I am up to. And he shall bring them to the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off its head from its neck and shall not divide it completely, then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is an offering, is a sin offering. You know, blood must still be shed, even though the head was not removed from that, those birds, they still had to shed blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And he shall offer the second as a burnt offering according to the prescribed manner. So the priest shall make atonement on the behalf of his sin which he has committed, and it shall be forgiven him. The sinner has complete forgiveness even with the little bird. And all of this points to the death of Christ. In verse 11, but if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sinned and shall bring to his offering one tenth of epa of fine flour as a sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, and he shall put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. The poorest of the poor were not left out. He could have bring what amounted to a tiny piece of bread. Now there is an exception here, and it's there's a couple of exceptions because of Hebrews. You remember says almost all things are purged with blood, but Jesus allowed, even though it's pointing to Christ, even a piece of bread to break. There is dignity in participation. You remember Michelle Bachman when she was running for president? Didn't get very far, and she was asked because her tax plan included everybody. And she said, everybody should pay something, even if it is only a dollar. People went crazy on her because of that. She said, in the Bible, everybody had a tax. Every person had to pay a tax, even though it was small. People went crazy. If you participate in something by giving something, even though it's small, is dignity in that. Verse 12. Then he shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it as a memorial portion, and burn it on the altar according to the offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin that he has committed in any of these matters, and it shall be forgiven him. The rest shall be the priest as a grain offering. Next, we come to specific acts of sin committed in ignorance in this next uh, section here. Again, no sacrifice, no forgiveness. Verse 14, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring to the Lord as his trespass offering a ram without blemish from the flocks with your valuation in shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary as a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing and shall add one-fifth to it. Remember Zacchaeus? He knew the law. He added to it. And give it to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. God was concerned about every aspect of Israel's life. Everything. 
They were to be the people he set apart to be examples to the world. Now I'm going to give you in your handout this morning key verse. It's not in Leviticus 5. It happens to be Leviticus 20, 26, because this is the key verse in the entire book of Leviticus. Here's what it says. Levit Leviticus 20, 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. He set them apart to be examples. You know, we Christians today, by the way, that word Christians means little Christ, are the people of God today. What God said to Israel, he says to us, for in the new relationship that we have with Christ, there is neither Jew or Gentile, for we are all one body in Christ. We are to be holy. We are to be set apart from the world. And finishing up in verse 17 to 19, if a person sins and commits any of these sins which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And he shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish from the flock with your valuation as a trespass offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him regarding his ignorance in which he erred and not know it. And it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord. As we said before, ignorance of the law is no excuse. This is true in civil law. It's true in moral law, and it is very true in God's law. By the way, that's why we do our best to go through the entire Bible, so we can know as much of the law as we can, and so we have no excuse for being ignorant of the law. I kind of ran a marathon this morning so I could get you out on time. I left some stuff out. I hope that's okay with him <laughs> and you. But we will get to the 33 graces because uh, it's quite a great list that I think would be interesting for all of us. So stay with us as we continue on this journey through Leviticus. God bless you all. Have a great day.